What's up, everybody? RGB here with the Pitch Putt and Puff podcast. Appreciate everybody tuning in before we get rolling. With our guest tonight, going to give a couple shout outs to a few sponsors. First, we got uh, Ty and Company over at 420 Bliss. Make sure you guys stop in there, check them out. 740 Hoosick Road in Shore, New York. Uh, you can find them online at 420 bliss.com. Everything you're looking for flower, pre roll, edibles, tinctures, vapes, you name it, they got it. Make sure you guys stop in there and support them and let them know the Pitch Putt and Puff crew sent you when you're in there. Make sure you grab a, uh, a pack of some blueberry, blueberry lemonade, jaunty gummies. Uh, these things are great, as well as the mango sunrise. Bunch of new carts available, with different flavors. They have the disposables as well. So make sure you guys pick up some jaunty when you're over at 420 Bliss. If you don't feel like going in, you want a delivery, go in the app store. Uh, just a little higher is the app. Click the 420 location. You can set up a pre-order or a delivery right on the app or online at 420-bliss.com. Uh, then don't forget as well to check out my man Marty, Trouble Off the T, troubleoffthetea.com. Uh, he's got a 50% off sale going on right now, so make sure you guys take advantage of that. Uh, also, check out the book available on Spotify and Audible. Marty Midian is the author, narrated by Jake Adams from Country Club Adjacent, so make sure you guys go and check that out. Also, go check out my man Jordan at the Putter Shop. Use promo code PPPP, 4 piece 15 for 15% off. He just made some custom ball markers for us. Um, I always forget to bring one up, but they are awesome. Everybody's been using them on the course. I actually had to mark them up. We had to put our initials on the back because too many people were using them to know uh, who was who. So shout out to Jordan for that. Use promo code PPP15 for 15% off at theputtershop.com. And then uh, we're 52 Sundays, big supporters of the Legends, official sponsor, and the Pitch Putt and Puff. So make sure you guys go give them a shout out. 52sundays.co. Just dropped a new line of hats over there as well. He, uh, they got a promo code for us, LGC15. If you're a Legends member, DM me. And I have a special promo code for you. You can use there. So we're going to take a quick break. Uh, and then we're going to get into it with our guest, Ro Pollard. Oh, there we go. Welcome back to the Pitch Punt Puff Podcast. My name is Roger, a.k.a. RGB. Uh, joining me tonight, we have Ro Pollard. Ro, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. It was, uh, I got the chance to meet you with the Upstate Golf Guys. I you on with Anthony and Mikey over there. It was a, it was a great conversation. Um, so I thought we'd bring it to the Pitch Putt and Puff. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into golf? Okay, great. I will. And yeah, it was really cool to meet you guys there. And I'm really appreciative of the invite to come on to um, to your show too. And yeah, I mean, I got into golf because I work in commercial real estate, actually um, on the commercial now general contracting side, but in a male dominated industry. And, um, you know, I've been doing that for 25 years. And golf is a huge part of that um, of that industry. It's a good way to network and like to build business relationships and close deals. And honestly, um, a bunch of us women were being left out of those conversations. And I was watching male colleagues get promoted faster and um, and beat me to the punch with getting to certain projects and stuff. And also I was watching them go and get to do a bunch of cool stuff that I was being left out of yeah. and uh, had like five other friends that saw the same thing happening. And they started this nonprofit that um, teaches women and anyone now um, we're open and inclusive to all, but started out empowering women um, to, to greater levels of influence through the game of golf in the architecture, engineering and construction industry. And um, so anyway, that's how I got into it. And I, um, you know, there was a bit of a story I told last time. It's kind of a long one going through a bad breakup. Um, that was really the first time like that was happening. The, the, sorry, I'll stop for a second. The creation of the nonprofit was happening in parallel with me going through a bad breakup and taking a girl's trip yep. and, um, trying to kind of get over that by, uh, burning like old cards and memorabilia, which we tried mm -hmm. to do. And it was, we're not successful at all. And I didn't feel better. And so we decided to, um, go try to hit something. And my friend Melissa had her golf clubs in the car and we went to the range and I made contact one time and it was like being struck by lightning, um, in the best way possible. And yeah. I never looked back since, yeah. uh, it's, it's been such a great journey. Once you hit that one good when you're like, Oh, this is, this is it. This is yeah. it. And it's a place like I always say, like, Growing up, I was an athlete. Basketball was like my main sport. But anytime I was stressed out about something, I could always find an empty basketball court and go take a ball and just start shooting, throw some music on, shoot around, and 
kind of just clear my head from it. Now as I'm older and can't run around and jump up and down like I did and risk getting hurt, I go to a golf course and just smack your range and just hit the ball around. It's just, you know, you kind of can just clear your head and forget about all the, the important stuff for a little while. That's what I, I think one of the things that I found about golf really quickly was it's almost like a form of meditation, you know, and it, yeah. and the way the mental game of golf is like 90% of what it's all about. And it's like 10% physical. I mean, there's a lot of skill. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to minimize, you know, the athleticism of the people that play golf professionally, or even, um, you know, that do that compete with it. I know it takes uh, in my journey, I'm noticing how much work it takes to keep your physical oh, yeah. body, you know, um, together to be able to do it. But like the mental aspect of it has been even more impactful to me than anything else. Yeah. And being able to go do it by yourself, you know, you, uh, or with people and, right using it as a universal language to talk to, to meet new people and talk to people that you've just met. Mm -hmm. so then, yeah. It's, it's definitely going to be with me for the rest of my life. My buddy Aaron always says the golf is the most important part of golf is the six inches between your ears. You know, <laughs> it's cause it's the mental aspect of it. And then like you just said too, it's, it's one of those things that brings people from all different walks of life together. You can exactly. get out on the golf course and you're, you can have a guy like you're saying a business a guy a suit and tie guy then you got the guy with the with the tool belt on uh, you know what i mean on the golf course and then you got you know the, the office reps and, and and all that so like it just brings a bunch of different people like i i work for a beer distributor so i get invited every once in a while to tournaments and it will be a owner of a bar then it will be the bartender and then it will be just me one of the sales reps with one of the vps or somebody from the company it's like all these people really wouldn't be in a conversation together unless we were out here playing this round of golf. And it's it's cool because you get to meet different people. And then I go into the bar and I know this guy, this guy, this guy. And it's just a good it's a good time, good networking thing. Yeah, you're sure. absolutely right about that. It definitely that's what I love about it, because I did not come from a place where golf was even an option for me. It just wasn't even known. And then it definitely wasn't accessible because mm -hmm. you know, golf definitely does get a rap for it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time and it also takes a lot of like um, influence for you to be in a certain, you know, um, circle to be able to to really have access to be able to go to the good golf clubs and things like that. But what I um, what I see now is that that's changing. It's changing. I think there's a lot of momentum to change that um, even more so than it is at this point. But you're right. It brings people together no matter who you are, where you're from. And um, it, it's that's been really cool to see. It was something I totally did not expect mm -hmm. for sure. It's like even with the pitch, putt and puff. So with with what I do on Sundays, a little bit different what those guys do. They go on they're on the golf tour where they play different courses all the time. Well, I have such a good relationship with our local course that I get two or three tee times every Sunday. Uh, eight to 12 of us go out. We all throw up a couple bucks. And we compete basically to everybody's having fun, but we're all competing at the same time. And you want to play good because you don't want to be that one guy who gets paired with the guy who had the best round of the day and you're shooting a terrible round and they end up losing because we, yeah. do, we do a blind draw at the end. And it really put it the variety of guys I have. I have guys I went to high school with. I have guys I just met on the golf course. I have the guy, the kid who, um, Anthony, he works at the course uh, doing the carts. Like he plays with us now because he sees us all going and have a good, I, I needed a guy one day, yeah, come play with us on Sunday. Uh, I'd love to. So now he comes out with us. So now we've got like the 12 guys out there and it's, I have a retired truck driver and my man, Fairway Mike, who's 70 years old. Like we have a bunch of different guys and they all get along. And none of us would be probably hanging out if it wasn't for golf. And that's the really cool thing about what we do. I love that too. And like the intergenerational connections that you're talking yeah. about. I mean, it yep. doesn't matter because I play with people too that are like now, I mean, I've been playing with seven year olds, you know, all like yeah. all, all the way up into, you know, I play with people too in their 80s. You know, I had a couple that were um, both in their 80s that like, you know, beat me, you know, not that <laughs> long ago. Yeah. Um, and it is, it's really fun to be able to just go out and hang out. And like you said, just bring people together that normally wouldn't, wouldn't come together and, and watch that magic happen. Yep. And now like even with a seven year old, I have a seven year old daughter who I brought out a, a few times this year. And it's so cool to see her. Like, I know she's probably doing it because she sees dad do it, mm -hmm. but to see her actually like hit the ball good and like, kind of like enjoy it. Dad, can we go again? Can we go again? Like, that's all like, I'm. Oh, yeah, we can go as much as you want, but I don't want you to do it just because I want you to go do it because you like it. I don't want you to do it because I'm doing it kind of thing. But 
she's always in the winter time. She, I put the putting green out and she's down the hallway putting with me and everything else. So it's, it's working out pretty good so far. So she seems to enjoy it, but it's fun where now I know in down the road as she gets older, if she wants to continue to play, I have something where me and her can go and bond and, and make it like our little thing that we, you know, every Thursday night, let's go out to the golf course kind of thing, you know, something fun to do. Definitely. Well, I also love that you're getting your daughter out there too, because golf used to not be a family sport. You know, it yeah. used to be kind of protected um, by men and they really didn't want women or children, you know, out on the golf course. And mm -hmm. I am seeing now that is totally changing the momentum oh, yeah. you have your daughters out there. Um, Cause a lot of the, the children that I um, had the privilege of coaching this past season, you know, their fathers would come up to me and say, you know, I'm so glad that, you know, my daughter is getting into this. It's so exciting to see her enjoying it. Like you said, you're not like dragging mm -hmm. her out because it's the only time, you right. know, the wife's like, you got to take the kid or you can't go, you know, yep. it's not that situation. It's like, everybody's having fun and they want to do that. And plus you're just setting her up. If she does go into the corporate world or whatever she does, that is such a mm -hmm. good skill for her to have. And the confidence level that she's going to have is incredible. Um, just really quickly, because you have a seven-year-old daughter, I have to share this. I went to the Seattle Sports Commission here has a women empowerment and women leadership breakfast every year. And I got the privilege to go last Friday. And um, statistically they say that little girls lose all of their confidence, which is so scary when you hear all between yeah. fifth and ninth grade. And if you don't get back into a sport and you don't have like a parent like supporting you, most girls never really get most of that back. And they I go into that. their adult life, you know, not right. feeling confident. So I think it's incredible what you're doing for her. Cause that's like the mean girl stage for little girls. Like that's like the, yeah, that's the tough little stage for kids. I could definitely see that. Yeah. That's why I always like, and she's, she's don't like, I don't have any other children. So like also want her to like, she plays basketball and softball too. Nice. So I want her to learn to lose. Cause like everything, she kind of is a little spoiled because it's only her and like the yeah. grandma, grandpa and everybody else really take, you know, spoils her as well as me and my wife. So I can't talk too much, but I want her to learn like the, the hard way of things too. You know, I want it to be a balance to where she's not surprised when she gets into the real world of really what's going on. Like when she plays a basketball game and they don't win, because obviously I'm going to let her win most of the time, but I don't, I don't let her win all the time. She does get upset, but I want her not to be crying after a, a basketball game and little other things, but we'll come with time. It will all come with time. No, it's great. You're right. Those are like really important life skills that that children learn, you know, through sports. And I think that that's really why, um, you know, since I've started doing this, golf has kind of um, become my entire universe, you know, and I'm trying to design my life around it every single part of it now. Yeah. Um, and not because I'm just addicted to golf and I love to play golf. That's definitely one part of it. But a bigger part of it is because I do see the intersection between sports and community and what happens with that and how impactful that can be. And um, I just hearing these numbers, the other number that I heard, which like this one, I'm, I'm like thinking that girls like your daughter are going to be able to help fix mm -hmm. is that if we keep going at the rate that we're going right now, we will reach gender equity in America in 84 years and things go well. Right. Like that's saying that's nothing so crazy. Bad happens to derail what we, the progress and the momentum that we have right now at the pace we're going now, it will be 84 years. So like your daughter will be 101 years old. <laughs> that's so crazy. Yeah. I'll be, you know, long gone. You'll right. like, unless some technology allows our lifespans, you know, to, right. to double. you know, we're never going to realize that. And as a woman who's been fighting for um, equal rights for a really long time, that, that hit me really hard. And um, I even had, you know, some of the women that were at the table with me, they're like, why are we even doing this then? Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm like, well, we're doing it because I believe like girls like your daughter who are seven are going to be able to accelerate that because they're, they're starting off so much differently than we did because of things like what you're doing and getting right. out there and making sure she's exposed and, and making space for her next to you so that she doesn't have to like push and shove and claw and scratch. Right. That. So um, anyway, I just, I, no, I that's cool you for that. I do. 100% get what you're saying. Did you know, um, so I had Mae Brennan on a few months back. I don't know if you know who Mae is. Um, she's also like a social media golf influencer. And 
she was telling me that there was one course I'm literally trying so hard to think of the name of it. And I even peeked at my notes to see if I could find the page. But there was a couple courses that don't even allow females to play still. And I was shocked to hear that. Yeah. Like, I was like, it's 2024. Like, what are we talking about here? That's just absurd. It's still true. And I'll tell you right here in Seattle, which is extraordinarily progressive in comparison to other parts of the world that I've been to um, and definitely where I grew up. There are country clubs here that still women, even if you're a member on your own, you can't tee off before one o'clock because the tee times in the morning are reserved for men. And they have different locker room accommodations where like I had a friend the other day, he was playing in a tournament uh, for two days and he had a crazy morning and we were just on the phone chatting and I was like, he said, oh, I didn't shoot very well. And I bet it's because I didn't really, I, I didn't have time to eat lunch, you know? And he's like, but I did, I was able, I knew exactly where to go since it was a private club, the, you know, the cafe and bar weren't open, but I just ran straight to the men's locker room because there's always food there. And I was like, wait, what? I'm like, hmm. there's food in the men's locker room. Like I've <laughs> never seen food in the women's locker yeah, room. Right. And he's like, you're lucky that you even have a locker room at most courses. Haven't you noticed that? And like, usually it's definitely an afterthought. And it's like a closet or something that's been converted, you know, right. it, over time. Yeah. Cause back in the twenties or the early 1900s, when it opened, they didn't have any, I could, yeah. It's there's crazy. Several, several private courses here where that's the case and they're really big ones. And it's, and hearing that actually over the last, um, a couple of weeks, I was like, Oh, there's so much work still for us to do, you know, right here. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the kind of stuff that fuels me. Um, I'm definitely very passionate about, and I'm not asking for, like, I'm not one of those feminists that's like, oh, you know, men are terrible and we shouldn't have them in our world at all. That is right. never, never crossed my mind. You know, I just want for women to be able to have an equal place, you know, at mm -hmm. the table and for all of us to just be able to get along and work together. And because you need all those perspectives, you need the male perspective, you need the female perspective. I mean, that's what makes us great and we're better together. And um, so anyway, yeah, that's definitely yeah. Still a thing. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense though. But you're also doing stuff on the page with like, the, I've seen some fashion stuff you do on there. And um, obviously you're, you're doing the thing with the first tee with the kids. Why don't you talk a little bit about the fashion side of things you're doing? Yeah, the reason why I got into the fashion side too is really because, um, you know, I, I started well, first off, when I started three years ago, which wasn't that long ago, fashion for women's also an afterthought, you know, in golf. It's yeah. um, usually, you know, some of our big brands, which I love and have many other shoes. I know you're a shoe sneaker guy like oh, I yeah. am too. And I love that company. Um, but they would just take like the men's version and they're just like slapping, you know, um, mm -hmm. sizing on it, but they're not really, they're not modifying it any other way. And some women are comfortable wearing that. And a lot of women aren't, you know, and I think that there are a lot of really great female um, fashion brands, too, that are popping up. They're women owned and smaller boutique brands that just weren't known. And so I saw an opportunity to help um, be able to give them maybe some um, some of my potential following like uh, exposure. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I would like to help them be exposed uh, to the greater population and my following and, and hopefully help them grow. And so most of the brands that I work with, not all of them, but the majority of them are um, BIPOC, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about the last time. But it's <laughs> yeah, because I didn't know I had to ask it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad you did. Like, I didn't know what, I did not know the acronym either, like three years ago. So yeah. It is something that's definitely new, but, um, you know, it's um, black indigenous people of color. And so um, there are a lot of lot of brands popping up and they they don't get the attention and, and that they deserve, unfortunately, on the main stage. Um, just because women in golf, we're just still such a fraction of what's out there. And, and again, not not dismissing all of the great things that um, the male owned and the larger brands have done. They've just been around for 100 years, you know, right. most of them. And, these are new. So um, what I do is I really try to uh, work with people that are trying to make an impact in the community as well. So most of the fashion brands that I work with um, have a nonprofit side to them or they're doing something. They have a cause or a mission that aligns with mine, um, which, again, is just trying to make golf accessible and equitable for everybody. So it's not just for the privileged and, and affluent anymore. Yeah, Because that's the I, I'm part of. Um... So there's the Legends Golf Club out of California, the Inland Empire in California. 
And the big reason I wanted to kind of get involved with him was because of all the stuff he was doing to give back. Like we don't really up here in upstate New York, there's not many things like golf tournaments to like there is for like charity events and stuff like that, but there's nothing like really giving back to something directly. So what we tried to do, we just timing wise and we were a little late to the ball game to set up a, uh, an event at the course. We wanted to do a tournament for like a back to school, mm-hmm. but there was no weekends, no weekends available to set up a tournament because they were all booked already. So next year we're pretty much going to plan it to where we can do like a back to school thing. Cause like the city, you know, the school I went to was, it's a, it's a city school, you know, a lot of kids there don't have a lot of things. So if everybody came, you know, it was going to be a cheap, hundred dollars for the tournament basically to cover your golf course and then everybody bring twenty five dollars worth of school supplies I and that will, that will get you raffle tickets and then i was going to reach out to a bunch of people i've had on the podcast and whoever and try to get like for raffle prizes shirts hats you know tees whatever the case may be um so me and anthony are and mikey are going to do something like that hopefully next year we really get it up and running just to kind of give back like like you said though it's not all about like you know, playing golf is great, but if you can play golf and help somebody out doing it, like that's a lot more fun doing something like that. You know, it's just, Absolutely. it's, I don't know. You know, you don't see a lot of that anymore. It's, no, it's you sad, don't. The sad thing. Well, you got to hit me up when you do that because I'm more than happy to like, you know, help you out with that. That's the thing is I oh, think, no. you know, meeting people too, like um, that are trying to make a difference in golf and they're small and, you know, they're doing great work. Um, but again, like the time it's going to take them on their own to get, a meaningful impact um, to show up in their lifetime is um, unfortunately a lot of cases way too long. But if we all band together and we start leveraging each other's superpowers and we work together, I, I just really do think that we could see some stuff really start to happen mm-hmm. quickly, um, which that's, I'm super excited about that. Nice. Now, what are some of um, some of the brands you work with? Yeah, I'm going to talk a lot about like, um, you know, I talked about one last time. And unfortunately, that one, um, you know, um, wasn't one of the women owned brands. So I want to talk about those today. Um, You know, I'm an ambassador for For All, which um, actually is two women, um, a woman named Jen and a woman named Michelle. And Michelle actually happens to be Mike Ware's wife. Um, I I don't know if you know Mike Ware, but he was the 2003 um, Masters, you know, winner. And I just played in the Boeing Classic actually um, this past August. And it was really cool to see him because what was really cool is I wore for all like a lot there and I'm just walking down um, the cart path and Mike had just finished his round and he and his caddy were like, walking by me and I was um, trying to help out and watch with the kids tournament that was happening, the putting tournament. And I didn't notice that he was trying to get my attention. And um, one of my friends was like, Hey, I think Mike Ware might be trying to, talk to you and I was like wait what and he was he was like hey hey he's like for all that's awesome so um I thought it was really cool that to see that it was that recognizable but um those two women are great and they actually started off just making women's clothes and they just launched um a a male uh clothing line too so um and they're a really cool company a lot of Jen's children work in the company and um the energy that she and Michelle have is really really cool and um you know again their their name says it all the reason why Mm -hmm. it's for all is because it's for everybody and they're trying to come out with cute clothes that you can um invest in and you can wear them on the golf course and you can also wear them as street wear and i do that often and i love that because then you don't have to have you know a closet full of clothes that you can only do one thing with it's just been really great and then Another one that I want to mention that's woman owned is um, out of California. It's called Sierra Madre. And again, it's two women that got together and they were just like, hey, we want to use sustainable fabrics and materials. And we also want our clothes to look cute and be like really minimalistic in design, but be very fashion forward. And um, their their clothing, I think, is really great, too. And I wear it, you know, all the time. Like, really, honestly, the only clothes that I have that I don't wear on the golf course are usually things that you'd wear to a special occasion for the most part now, uh, my clothes are like synonymous, uh, you know, if I'm going to work or I'm going to go play golf, like, you know, I can, I can make those things work together, which I think is really cool. Um, and then I talked a little bit about Vivanti last time too, which is Mm -hmm. a company. Um, and that's actually, um, Caesar. So a guy started that business and, um, he's Puerto Rican and, um, he makes these really cool, high fashion, high quality leather golf gloves and now golf magnetic golf towels, which have really cool patterns too. 
Yeah. So our, I reached out to Caesar. Our timing has not lined up like three times in a row. Oh like, no. We got, yeah, we got to get something back on the books here. I'll reach out to him again. Yeah, we yeah. had something scheduled. I had something come up, and then the next time he had something come up, and then I, the same thing happened the last time. I was like, oh, like we'll, we'll figure it out, buddy. Don't you worry. So I'll get him back on here. Yeah, he's from, he's from East Coast, right? He's from New he, York. He's in New York. Yeah, he's yeah, in, yeah. Um, I think he's he's in the city. So he's like in the Manhattan area and a lot of okay. his stuff, a lot of his ball markers and designs are actually um, their plays on the New York subway, you know, system and some of the neighborhoods and stuff. So if you're okay, cool. you know, a New Yorker and you're really into, you know, Queens and all of the things that yeah. some of the tradition and vibe of New York, his, his products definitely have that. And he's been really, really um, supportive of a lot of our female nonprofit and some other things too. He's just um, been a really great partner. Another brand that I rep is actually um, uh, one of my former employees from the company that I left in July. Her sister, um, Pilar uh, Alfaro, started something called Alpha Athletics and it's A-L-F-A and it stands for Alpha, which is her, her last name is Alfaro, but it stands for Alpha Female. And um, she designed waterproof clothing because here in the Pacific Northwest, yeah. like I was telling you before we started recording, we um, played all weekend long and it was torrential downpour rain at one point and even hailing. And like, you know, you're and you're like, it's it's October. We're not even into like the full fledged winter yet. Yeah. Um, but here you're pretty much in the winter. You're wearing like the plastic black trash bag looking, you know, waterproof suit all the time. And oh, you yeah. still feel good playing in that. And so Pilar was able to design like high fashion, waterproof, fleece lined gear for women. And it's, um, she only has a couple of products, but they're really great. Um, she has pants and a really nice jacket. And she even designed the crop top is a really big thing for women, but this yep. one's got like another layer. So whenever you're swinging, if you don't want exposure mid drift, it won't. Um, and it's fleece lined and really warm. And so Again, yeah, make some for the men because we could use that up here in upstate New York, too. <laughs> yeah, she wants to expand. You know, the thing that um, I've noticed in working with a lot of these really great boutique brands is the fashion world is brutal to get into and trying yeah. to get um, to know what inventory to have and how much and like all of that. And so product development's really expensive, too. Um, and then supply chain issues are a thing, you know, and That's so a big thing. That's a real yeah. big thing. So I have. Um, with the with the women's side of things like the fashion i had audrey uh mattel on yeah uh, the, audrey. uh, audrey's yeah, the best her and brian are great and uh she's the one who really opened my eyes to like how women like the clothing for women's golf is kind of was it's non-existent for the most part except for like these small companies that you're speaking of and like you can't go she's like i go into you know a sporting goods store to go grab a golf skirt or te and i have to get a tennis skirt and then, go get this. And she goes, half the time I was going to other stores and grabbing something and putting, putting something together. And it wasn't even like golf, golf wear. Mm -hmm. she, she goes, but now obviously slowly, like you're talking about, they're popping up. So it is cool to see that the women's brand, especially because women in golf is blowing up. Like you see the girls, like the golfer girl, uh, uh, golfer girl games, all those girls are out there. My, I watched that with my daughter just because yeah. that's the other thing. Like I want to show her that females, can like girls girls can do this too it's not just me and dad and his friends going out and stuff like that even with basketball thank goodness for caitlin clark no like, shout, kidding, right? shout out caitlin clark because it, it made it enjoyable for me to actually sit down and watch a game because i wanted to see if this girl was going to chuck up 40 footers like she was and and then pumping her chest and talking uh, talking trash while she was doing it like that's so fun to see for everybody so like my daughter's seen her excel at basketball and then my daughter's slowly starting to like basketball they actually I'm going to pump my chest out a little bit to ask her if they want to move up to she's in second grade and she wanted, uh, they want to push her up to the third or fourth grade team for some, some extra work. So I was pretty excited about that. We'll, we'll see what she wants to do. I'll let her go to a practice or two and I'll probably, I'll probably let her try it out. And if she likes it, I'll keep her in it. If not, we'll just go back to doing what she's doing. Cause I like the, the second grade, first and second grade is like just basic drills. We don't play games or anything like that, but third and fourth grade would be games. So We'll see. We'll yeah. see. I love that you brought up Caitlin Clark and I love that you brought up like you want your daughter to see women doing this because and you'll find I'm kind of a data nerd when it comes to things. I like to throw out statistics. I, I do a lot of research, but 
I do that because um, not to sound smart, but when I'm talking to people, trying to help them understand and see the brevity of the situation that we're facing right now, mm -hmm. the, gravity, the gravity of the situation um, that we're facing. Um, so little girls, if they do not see a woman doing something by the age of five years old, they lose any and all hope, like 98% of them lose mm -hmm. any and all hope that they'll ever do that someday. So for instance, like, um, you know, be a president or whatever that is like women, like I was like, that will never happen in my lifetime, you know? And so, and your daughter being seven, it's really great that you're doing the things that you're doing with her now, because I think that that statistic is going to change again with her generation and hopefully mm -hmm. Um, maybe even the one, you know, right before hers too, um, that we can try to make that not be a thing. So right. I'm glad you're doing that. And um, at that breakfast I went to too, they mentioned Caitlin Clark a lot and some of these other women in sports. And they're saying this isn't like a, you know, flash in the pan. And this is, this is something that's gaining real traction. And we mm -hmm. have you know, um, we really can um, now start to see, I think, the impacts that that's going to have. Because I had a bag lane here. I wish I still had it. Um, the rain. Seattle is very fortunate that we have a professional women's soccer team and we yep. have the Seattle Storm here, too. So I actually got to see Caitlin Clark play. Um, oh, nice when uh when they the fever came to play the storm which was really cool they did that twice in the season um but i have a bag that um i bought at that event that says everyone watches women's sports because everyone is starting to watch women's sports yeah. and tv like three years ago this um i actually learned this from we have an all women's sports bar here that only shows women's sports and okay. they the sound on and it's called rough and tumble. And, um, the, one of the founders, Jen was saying that when they started rough and tumble, they were worried about the business model because they're like, there's not that many women's sports being aired for them to be able to say, we view, we only show women's sports all the time. Yeah. But, um, when they started three years ago, I think they were saying something like 5% of sports airtime was dedicated to women's sports today, where we stand right now, it's 15%. So in three okay. We've tripled it. And they're saying by the end of 2025, they expect it to be at least 20%, maybe even more. So it is rising quite drastically. And that's not just because women are putting pressure on, you know, the country or these stations to show it. It's because everyone is saying, I want to watch Caitlin Clark play basketball or yeah. I want to see the U.S. rugby team, you know, that uh, I now want to watch the the rugby sevens, you know, because they won the bronze at the Olympics, like, or right. I want to see Nellie Corda, you know, and, and Lexi and Charlie Hall. I want to yeah. see. Them. So um, I'm I'm very excited to see that that's changing. So your your friends who had the bar probably once they seen Caitlyn going off, they're like, yes, jackpot. <laughs> Caitlyn was hugely impactful to this, as was Nellie Corda, as yes. was Charlie Hall. You know, just um, you know, to bring it back to golf for a second, and then most certainly, you know, Iona on the U.S. Women's Rugby Team, and um, some of these other female um, athletes that are just like, you know. I don't know. They're busting down the they're busting down the barriers, which I think is really cool, and yeah. they're really fun to watch. You know, right? It is fun to watch too. It is fun to watch. Like rugby is one sport I don't I don't watch. I'll be honest with you. One of my best friends is huge into rugby. He's traveled all over the all over the world playing rugby. Um, he coaches rugby down in the city. I'll be actually down in the city most of November and December, uh, helping him with his Christmas tree business. Oh, yeah, the Christmas tree stuff. I can't wait. Yeah, to yeah. I got to all have stories. <laughs> great stories coming back from that. And uh, we're, he's the rugby guy. I wouldn't understand rugby if to watch it. Like, I wouldn't know what was going on. Like, I learned hockey by playing the video game, like what icing and everything else was by playing video games. Like, rugby, I don't think I have a chance of figuring out what the hell is going I, on. Yeah. I have no idea what's happening at the rugby games. Um, you know, I went to almost every single – we are, again, fortunate in Seattle that we have one of the 16 major league rugby teams here. Um, we have the Sea Wolves here, and I went to almost every one of their home games, and including the – the divisional championship game. And like, I had no idea what was going on, but I had the best time of my life and they are the most kind, thoughtful, like mm -hmm. players and fans. I mean, they, I'm still friends with most of them. A lot of them go back home. The international players will go back to New Zealand or Australia, you know, to be with their families in the off season. And then you've got um, some of them that stay over here and um, play actually a bunch of my, my sea wolves right now are in New York playing okay. 
the, in the New York Rugby League. Um, and so there's at, at least three of them there. Um, Devin Minante and Quan are all out there in New York playing right now. And they'll come back, you know, in the spring and summertime. But I will tell you, you don't have to know to go. It's just if you've yeah. got a rugby team near you, I would suggest – just given the game a try. Um, it is the largest growing spectator sport in America. And I can see why it's just, yeah. um, and then the, the women's teams are coming up strong too in rugby, which I really love um, to see. And, and the, the men's rugby team and the women's rugby teams they they do a lot of stuff together. They support each other, which is mm -hmm. really cool to see. Yeah, that's cool because it helps. It just helps grow the game. That's all yeah. you work together. It helps grow the game. That's like a lot I try to do here with the podcast is, you know, get people like you on and then like other small businesses, startup companies, get them on because, you know, I have, you know, I'm not Joe Rogan by any means, but I have, I'm not getting that with 50 million views an episode or whatever the hell he gets, but I'm just an audience to where they might not know about some of this stuff that's going on. They might not know, might not even know that like until we talked about it tonight, that women can't get on certain courses and, and yeah. stupid things, you know, crazy things. Like when you say it out loud, it's crazy to say that. But like, just try to help out like a company coming up, like a clothing company or a glove company or a putter company, whatever it is, just give it a little bit of an audience here, upstate New York, my few listeners in the California, Texas area, stuff like that. And just give them an ear and be like, oh, maybe this is something I'd be interested in too. And obviously some of the female listeners or even some of the guys who listen, who have daughters, bring them out to the course with you, bring them yeah. out to the course with you, Who you know, bounce around. Like what I luckily have a, little bit of leeway where i go i try to go at nighttime when there's not a you know a full t sheet and i'll jump around hold the hole like we hit a part three all right there's no one at this next hole let's go and then i'm not going to hold anybody up i'm not going to get anybody's way like all right she ends the best thing is when she knows it's time like say all right pick that up we're going to go up here okay so pick it up and come running back to the cart all excited and then we'll go put on the green so it's an experience too to spend time with your kid which is cool so i always tell the dads bring your daughters out where you bring your sons out where you get the kids out there on the course it's a it's a great bonding thing and like you said yeah. in the beginning building relationships and preparing them for the future the confidence of going to play in a, a work tournament with big you know big reps and you want to make a good impression and bring it back the next time make sure you know how to play some golf yeah <laughs> You know, too, when your daughter walks into a room and she's the only one like her, she is not going to have to have anybody make space for her. She's going to own her space and be able to be confident in that space. And it is because of the things that you're doing there. No, I love what you're doing and what the other guys are doing on their um, podcast. I think that's where, you know, I saw a lot of synergy in um, meeting you guys because the reason... I have Rowan Co. And what that stands for is actually it's it's me, but me and all of the partners that are trying to make a difference. And like, how do you help each other out? People often ask me, they're like, how did you grow your Instagram following so quickly? Mm -hmm. Like, what was your secret? And I'm like, you know what my secret was? I met other people that were also trying to grow their following and we started supporting each other and we started sharing our profiles on each other's profile. And then I started meeting companies that were also trying to be up and comers. Now, don't get me wrong. I had some help from one of the big ones, you know, and that's kind of what, you know, like what you're doing for your daughter and what you're doing right now for me is you're creating space for us and helping us out. And, you know, I was very fortunate that early, very early on in my golf influencing career that I, um, you know, started working with people like PXG, mm -hmm. PXG like, helped me out because it, it legitimized, you know, what I was trying to do. Right. Um, and I'm really picky about the big companies I work with too. You know, the reason why I chose to be such a super fan of their brand and work with them is because of the work that, that Renee Parsons does as the president of the women's, um, uh, of the apparel company. And she is huge into supporting children and women, um, especially getting into the game and does a lot of, a lot of philanthropic work as well. Um, and so she's actually one of my um, role models. You know, she's um, really big into fashion. She came from the fashion industry before she went into PXG and then she started playing golf. And then, you know, she started doing kind of the same thing on a much grander scale, but um, her team has been really cool. And um, that has helped me tremendously be able to do the things that I do um, and help the others out now and that it I'm still feeling I don't do as much work with them anymore um, mm -hmm. but the benefits of them helping me in the beginning are invaluable and they're still I, I'm still seeing them right right yeah absolutely that's that's the thing is really getting your foot in the door with a with a company that's going to show you some support and and help push you as well it's that's all you really can ask for yeah to really get it off the ground 
But, Ro, I like to wrap it up with three questions, um, all golf related. So, what is your favorite club in your bag? <laughs> you know, if uh, I think last time you guys asked me that question, I think I said my four wood, and everybody was like, ooh, interesting choice. Um, I would say now, uh, my favorite club in my bag, because you know how it goes in golf. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Sometimes you're doing really well with your long irons and sometimes uh, you're doing better with uh, your, you know, your short game. Mm -hmm. um, my driver is my favorite club in my bag right now. My four wood's still really great and saves me all the time, but my driver is um, just something I've been able to connect with lately. I can tell you my least favorite clubs right now are my wedges and my putter. And I've really got to get that together because it has, I went from being able to shoot in the um, high eighties, which I was proud of back into the hundreds because my short game's just fallen off the cliff. So I'm the complete opposite of you. I love my put I love my putter and my wedges. Um, my putter, I it's funny. My buddy Fairway Mike, the old guy, he goes to me the other day. He goes, "Hey man, you ever think about charging people?" I'm like, "Charging people for what?" Like listening to the. I had no idea what he was talking about. It was just out of the blue, and we were we were playing around. And uh, he goes for putting lessons. He goes, "I haven't seen you three put a hole, and I couldn't tell you how long." And he's just going. He goes, "Your reads are like I." I play there every day. So I know the way, you know, the air, the undulations of the greens and stuff. So he goes, you got to get, then we're playing again today. And he's like, man, I'm telling you, but the guys brought it up on Sunday. Like, Raj, I don't think you're three putted today. People, we were struggling with the, with the putter, but I can't get off the tee. Like I'm sponsored by trouble off the tee, my man, Marty. And it's like the perfect sponsor for me because I have the most trouble to get off the tee. So it's like, it's tough. And it's, it's a frustrating game because if the, my driver's on, I have a great round and I'm shooting a low 80 round. If my driver's not on and I'm struggling, I'm probably shooting a mid nineties round. And it's like, yeah. come on. It's so, so frustrating. Cause I know I can hit it cause I've done it a million times, but I just can't consistently get off the tee. Well, I'm three putting almost every single time. And you know, you think about that. You're like, that's 18 strokes on top of your yeah. game, you know? And I, no, this is crazy at 45 years old, but I decided I was going to come up with this really big giant stretch goal um, a few days back. And I did it again because um, I saw Western Washington PGA, they have, um, you know, a chapter out here and they just elected a female as president, which is really, really cool. But on her Instagram post, she posted that she just, and um, that she just made this presidency. And she's like, thanks to all the ladies in the room. And it was her and two other women and like, <laughs> people in the room. And I'm like, and you know, the men voted for her, obviously that's right. how she got it because the three, the other two women that were in there weren't enough for her to be elected. So what's really cool about our chapter here is they're extraordinarily supportive of women in the industry, but there's less than 10%. It used to be less than 5% of um, the golf industry was female and women outside of the players, of course, but like just people in the industry. Yeah. Now it's less than 10. So it's getting better and better and better, but we still have a long way to go. But long wind winded way of saying that at 45, you know, when you, you kind of peak at 30 years old and then from this point on, you're just fighting to keep distance and swing speed and all those things. That's what you're training for. Well, I'm going to try to train to actually, um, you know, go out and, and try to get my pro card. And um, I want to do that not because I think I want to teach golf. I just want to understand every aspect of teaching golf. But I also want to have the opportunity to get involved in things like our Western Washington chapter, because I think as women, I know a lot of women here that have their pro card that are not showing up in that room. And we mm -hmm. cannot complain about not being part of something if we're not willing to be part of something. Right. Um, and I can't really talk a lot about it. If I am, you know, not even, I haven't even done the work to get the chance to be in that room. So right. the journey and the training, I think to do that or what, what really is going to be valuable. If I can get to that goal, great. Um, if I don't reach that goal, you know, that's going to be okay too, but I'm definitely going to, I'm going to really try very hard to do that. I think you'll be just fine because you seem like the type of person, once you put your mind to something, you're going to get it. Thank you're, you. And you're, and you're not going to stop until you do. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I, that's a, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to maybe, injure myself, you know, like we were talking, I have a sprained ankle and yeah. I have a neck and a shoulder problem, but I'm still like, I'm playing Friday in the rain, you know, and then I'm mm -hmm. going to go to band and dunes in a couple of weeks and play. And I'm just, you know, I'm going to push through. So I appreciate that you can sense that in my personality. Oh, yeah. 
Yep. And speaking of band and dunes, what is that's one of the, basically the next question. What is the uh, your favorite course you've ever played? Okay, so like I'm glad I got the hat on that I got on right now because it definitely I would have said it would be you know Pacific Dunes at Band and Dunes for sure. Um, but now the rivalry because I played here on my birthday this year is Wine Valley, which is in Walla Walla, Washington. Mm -hmm. The reason why I liked Wine Valley a little bit more is because of the weather. Like it wasn't because of the scenery. The scenery is not even comparable. Um, and then Chambers Bay, like those three, it, they're all a tie for me. Um, they're just absolutely gorgeous and all very different in their own way. But um, yeah, if you haven't been to Wine Valley, I, it's it's one of the bucket list courses here. Um, and I think a lot of people travel to do it, but it's like, it's more desert climate and you get to still see like all the mountains and everything beautiful of the Pacific Northwest. But it was actually like, I wore like a tank like a, a sleeveless golf shirt mm -hmm. and like a skirt and i was not freezing cold and being pelted by wind yeah, and right. you know that happens at banded dunes it also can happen at chambers bay chambers bay can be a good mix of wine valley and, and pacific dunes actually mm -hmm. from a weather standpoint right but yeah those what about you i'd like to know yours so i never really had a chance to go play like like a big like pga style course but the nicest course and like See, this question is kind of open-ended, too, because it's not necessarily, like, the, the nicest course you ever went to, but, like, the favorite, your favorite course. So it could be just, like, the best time you had. So my yeah. buddy, uh, my buddy's wedding was down in Texas, and there was 25 guys down there, or 24 of us, and we had all, all we did a scramble. But it he picked the teams perfectly because it was guys that, like, we went to high school with, college with, who we haven't seen in years and actually got a chance to, like, all hang out with. And it's the type of guys where – you haven't seen him in 10 years, but you pick right back up where you left off. So, like, we were out there. Just the vibe of the whole day was great. The course is beautiful. Like, we're playing – up here, we play next to pine trees. Down there, it was cactuses and snakes on the ground and all this other crazy shit that we don't see. So, it was just really the vibe and the experience. Of, it was called uh, Slick Rock, I believe that was the name of the course. Oh, nice. Right outside of Austin, Texas. Some of the fastest greens I've ever played on. Um like I said, I'm a pretty pretty good putter, and I definitely uh, we had a tough day putting on that course. Oh, putting on that man. course, I hate to hear that, but I love that because you're right. Like golf courses, like playing a beautiful like TPC course or whatever, like a PGA rated course is awesome. Yep. And I have had the privilege of getting to do that. I feel very grateful for that. Um, but the company that you're playing with for me is more All important. the difference. And I have had just as much fun playing um i've had a terrible time actually playing on some of the the really really nice courses before because mm -hmm. of the people that you were with you yeah. know um and then i've had like you said an e just as good if not better time playing because um at a small neighborhood you know par three course because actually you know crossroads in bellevue um here which is a par three course it is a like literally behind a um I would say a mall that's seen its better days, <laughs> you so, know, uh, like most and, malls in America. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's just, it's a teeny tiny city maintained, um, course. And, you know, there's these little micro pine cones all over the green and the tea boxes are these boxes with mats that are, you know, have obviously seen their better days and stuff too, but getting to play there with like the kids has just been yeah. awesome. It's yep. been the, my favorite things to do. So yep, the vibe, that's what it's really all about. That's like, even like the other day I was struggling a couple weeks ago and I had probably my worst round of the year. And I said to the guys at the end, I was like, could I play terrible today? Could one of you guys tell me, could tell that I shot my highest round? They're like, dude, what? You shot that? I'm like, yeah, most of the, sometimes, you know, back three years ago, I would have been all pissed off, slamming my club, throwing a ball in the woods, whatever, like this sucks. <laughs> I want, want to go home. Anthony did it the other day. He was struggling putting and we were on like just about to get to the turn. And he goes, I don't even want to play anymore. I just want to go home. I just want to, because he was just, he was thinking too much. Mm -hmm. And I started making fun of him. And I was like, come on, man, get in the car, you know, because he played down in Hilton Head. And he was talking about the Bermuda grass. I'm like, well, we're back in upstate New York. There's no more Bermuda grass. Let's go. And he eventually, like, just laughed it off and got out of it. Ended up hitting a birdie, won nice. a skin. So he won some money. And then he ended up coming in, like, second place. So I think he ended up walking away with some cash. But he battled through the round and didn't shoot awful. He shot bad, but he didn't shoot awful. So you get there's times where you just battle through it and make fun of it if if anything. That's what it's really all about. 
Exactly. That did look like a really nice trip. I watched the, you know, progression of that on Instagram. Yeah. And I do think the just really quickly, last thing about Wine Valley, the reason why I really liked Wine Valley is I came six inches from getting a hole in one. Oh. And I was like, so excited. I'm like, what? I, I don't think I could ask for anything better for my 45th birthday than a hole in one. A you hole know? in one, yeah. I hit, yeah. I hit great. It was a par three. And I hit this great tee shot. And I mean, it hit the green and we're watching it from the tee box and we're like, is it going to go in? Is it going to go in? Oh my God. And, you know, and we ran, I mean, I, I was like running down there and you get up <laughs> to the hole and I'm like, it was like this close. Oh. Still, it was a birdie, you know, I'll take right. that any sure. day. But um, yeah, it was but Fun. Putting a two on the card at any point is a great feeling. Yeah, for sure. exactly. It, yeah. The ones that stink to it, like when you hit the, like on the par threes where you hit what you think is a hole in one and it hides behind the pin and you can't see it from where you are. <laughs> oh man. Those That's are the worst. It's like, oh my goodness. It just starts sprinting up there. I could, oh yeah, I've been there. Yeah. I've I mean, I was there. like, I kept telling myself, like, no way, no way, no way, no way. But you're hoping inside, you know, you're oh, absolutely. I really hope so. And then we got there and it wasn't quite in there, but um, I still pretty much my friend that was with me took a video and <laughs> the video is funny watching me like walked the sound and stuff. And then I get down there and everything. And they're like, I think that was almost worth you not hitting a hole in one. It was so comical, but <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> anyway, man. I still haven't gotten one. So I want to get one really bad, but me neither. I've been close a few times lately and it's like, it's the same hole every time it's the 13th hole at our, our course for your park. And it's so frustrating because I'll get up there, same thing. And I'm like, I'll see my divot mark, and I'm like, if that bounced literally like two inches, three inches to the left or right, I'd be in the hole and wouldn't be three or four feet past the hole right now. It's like, oh, uh, I actually hit the, I almost had a nice eagle today. Nice. Uh, about 160 yards out, one hopped it, rolled it up, hit the stick, and it bounced away a couple feet. I was like, oh, uh, a little too hot going in, but I got a couple of those this year, so I'm not too mad about it. I got, I got, I think in my career about ten eagles. So that's amazing. I've never had an eagle either. I mean, I've had birdies I can count on one hand. You know, mm -hmm. the first year I played, I, you know, I do think there is something to playing the same course though, having a home absolutely course, play repetitively because I did have that in the first like year and a half that I was golfing, and I had a lot more birdies. And it was mm -hmm. those are very hard course. It's Snoqualmie Ridge, which is a TPC course. It's where they hold the Boeing Classic. So it is a PGA rated course. And um, people are like, whoa, you learned to play there. And I was like, yeah. And like, and I got several birdies there, you know, in my first mm -hmm. year. And then now they've been few. I bet you I've, I probably have six or seven total. I should go back and count that. But uh, half of them happened in that first year and a half on that course because you kind of would get used to it. You know, you're kind of like, I know if I can hit this right, I know where I need to hit it, what club I need to hit it with. And you, you feel good about that. Cause you're like, oh, yeah. wait, I'm actually I'm being accurate and the ball is going where I'm intending for it to go. It's not just luck or, you know, right. whatever, so. I don't use a scope. I don't use a lot of the times GPS at our course. Like I can walk out, I heard I'm 165, 170 yards probably use my eight iron okay let's grab the eight iron like i can just look at it and say right, this is probably an eight iron shot seven iron that's shot awesome. but i'm also there five days a week so that's I'm really in. cool that you get to get out that much that's i love that yeah it's awesome especially in the summertime um with work i'll go in i go in at 3 a.m 4 a.m so oh, i get okay. i get out at noon so i go and play right after work and then with the kiddo in school i go until i gotta get her off the school bus so get about 13 14 holes a day in during the during the week that's in awesome the, in the spring and the fall sleep, though. like that's <laughs> eh, you know i get a few hours here and there I get a few <laughs> hours here and there so it's not i'm there. with you i i need to prioritize my sleep a little bit better but i'm like there it's just hard you're like there's you you know there's so much to do there's so much to do there's really like the podcast when i first started it was all like fun just as a joke like talking about the guys and stuff and then it kind of turned into like a second job which i love like i love like it's the same thing as going out and playing golf i love the networking aspect of it meeting all new people and stuff so i don't mind it one bit though i get used to it i take naps i get a little power nap here oh. and there so yeah there that's you all go. you can do and then <laughs> we to wrap up with the last question three people you would add to your dream foursome who are they Oh yeah. You guys asked me that last time. Now I'm like, maybe I need to change this up a little bit. Cause, um, I, I last time I said Bryson Shambo and Roy and Nellie and Nellie was going to be my partner. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I just yeah. banter back and forth between the other two. 
Oh gosh. But you know, and it's hard to like think that I'd want to try a different, but I think like Freddie couples, cause he's a hometown hero here okay. and I like to play with him once he's done a lot of, I, you know, for you and me, he's the guy that brought sneaks into the game. Like he mm. was the first guy that said, I'm not going to wear, you know, the traditional Oxford kind of hard soul, you know, mm -hmm. shoes that you're used to and kind the of bowling, the in. bowling shoes. Yeah. And I just found that out. And so I was like, whoa, how did I not know that? That's awesome that Freddie did that. And so I'd love to talk to Freddie about that. And so yeah. I think it'd be a really cool, and I'd bring you with me since you're such a <laughs> so that we love can it. talk to Freddie about that um, and find that out. And then, you know, I really want to, I want to meet Charlie Hull too and talk to her because mm -hmm. there's a woman that's really like, you know what? I don't really care what people think. I'm going to be me and I'm going to do me. Um, and she does listen. She's like, I get it. I'm a role model and I need to modify some of my behavior because there are children watching me. Right. But like, for the most part, I love what she's doing. Like she has great fashion sense too. And she's a great golfer and she's powerful. And watching her swing is just incredible. And I think she'd be fun to have a chat with. Yeah. For sure. She's so funny. He's just sparking up the cig right I'm just sitting there chilling. Like, it's so, like, old school. Like you said, though, I don't give a shit what you think. I'm going to be me. And that's, I, I love that shit. Yeah, people it's call so her fun. the John Daly of, like, our generation or whatever. Yeah. I think John Daly would be fun to hang out with, too. Yeah, you know, I'd absolutely. love to go play a round of golf with him sometimes. So, you know, it's really hard to decide. I mean, they're just – and Michelle – Michelle West, you know, is, is my fashion role model, you know, when you talk about a shoe, you know, mm -hmm. fanatic, her sneaks are awesome too. So right. it'd be cool to have her around too. So that's way more. We might have to, you know, I don't know. We have to play some. Gonna have to turn this into a little scramble. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, bro, I really appreciate your time. Um, why don't you let the listeners know where they can find you? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram at row R H O dot Pollard P O L L A R D. Uh, soon you'll be able to find me at row and company dot com. It's under construction right now, but um, yeah, look for that to come soon. But the best way to get a hold of me is definitely through Instagram right now. Awesome. Once again, Ro, I appreciate your time and uh, make sure you guys go and check out her page and anything she's got coming up. I appreciate you guys tuning in. We'll be back on Friday with a preview of this upcoming weekend. And we'll talk to you then. Later. Appreciate Ro jumping on there. She's got a lot going on out there in the Seattle area. A um, bunch of things coming up. So definitely keep an eye out for her new website. Um, also, real quick, I want to give a shout out to the Cart Boys. They were former guests on here. They were nice enough to have RGB on as a guest. We got talking some... Miami Hurricanes, Florida State, some pitch, putt, and puff. Told some real crazy stories from back in the day that I didn't even think I've told on the pitch, putt, and puff podcast. So go give that a listen. Um, the Cart Boys podcast available on all platforms, Spotify, Apple. I believe they're on YouTube as well. Cart Boys, C-A-R-T-B-O-Y-Z, Boys Podcast. I uh, appreciate those guys having me on. So make sure you guys go and check out that episode to get a little behind the scenes on RGB. Appreciate everybody tuning into the Pitch Pot and Puff, and we will see you on Friday with a preview or pick some teams for this week's upcoming scramble. Talk to you then. Later. <laughs>